Are we good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, take two. Well, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to, to be here. We're in person. Woohoo! Yeah. Yes, yes. So we made it happen after um, a year plus. So I uh, want to invite everyone to the Office of Police Ombudsman Commission uh, meeting here on April 19th, 2022. And um, we, we have a packed agenda here today. I want to welcome the public. And I also want to move to see if we want to uh, approve the agenda. We had time to look over. And I, I did. I'll make a motion to um, approve the agenda as written. OK. There's I'll second that motion. And there's a second. OK, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you for that. Okay. And if we could look over the March 15, 15th minutes. I don't, I don't think it's um, in the packet here. I, or did I, am I missing mine? No, I don't see it either. Ooh. Um, yes. I don't. Right behind the first page. Is it? Oh. oh, it's behind the agenda. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, is there? So we had a visit from our um, friend from Office of Civil Rights, Jarrell Haynes. Mm -hmm. We heard from the uh, about the OPO monthly report, February. Do we have a, a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from March 15th, 2022. I second. All right, there's a motion and there's a second. Ed. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that is passed unanimously. Okay. Um, do we have any public forum? Is there anyone from the public? All right. You have the floor. Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, a 22-year police accountability expert. I now have evidential proof that the Spokane Police Department is targeting community activists and community leaders with harassment and intimidation using the color of law to do so. I brought up this fact at City Council after my April 2021 jaywalking arrest, in which within a few hours after my arrest at three in the morning, the, e the police chief was emailing a select few members of City Council calling my arrest of a self-proclaimed activist. People told me that I was being paranoid thinking the police were targeting me for my political beliefs, and yet the same phrase Self-proclaimed activists showed up 56 days later when the sheriff's office released a 16-minute YouTube video calling me a liar about the fact that SPD is, was the third deadliest police force in the nation. Two days after that, the sheriff's video, the same phrase, self-proclaimed activists, shows up in newly released public records of a series of emails to all of the officers in the downtown precinct from police leaders in which these emails talk, talk about me as well as several other well-respected activists. This new proof that I have has clearly shows that we are being targeted with harassment and intimidation, and this has been happening to the activist community and city leaders, and has had a chilling effect in our community. Other examples of targeted harassment of those that are standing up for police reform, the police guilds accu accused a city council member of bullying a newly hired officer who had killed several people as a Seattle officer. 
the sheriff interjected himself in political ad campaigns against city council candidates that were pushing for police reform. A different city council member is dealing with a leaked body camera video which give, was given by officers to conservative media as an attempt to somehow besmirch this council member's good character all because they support police reform. Officers doing ride-alongs with city council candidates as a way of evaluating them for an election endorsements by the uh, Spokane Police Guild. What I've laid out here tonight to you all is a clear case of an official SPD policy and strategy aimed at doing harm to those that dare to speak up for police reform by using police powers and mechanisms in a targeted harassment and intimidation of these people. These police reform laws have saved lives, so why is the Spokane Police Department so afraid of police reform and accountability that they've resorted to these kind of tactics listed above, which shows that law enforcement isn't being apolitical, which the police chief said many times now that they should be. Peace officers now must work on our str streets with the, with the onus on them to change themselves. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Uh, do, do we typically get to ask questions? Okay. Uh, uh, would you like to be, uh, how would you like to be referred? I know you have as Anwar Peace, but uh, how would you like to be referred? Mr. Peace, Anwar. Mr. Peace, yeah. okay. Whatever you, whatever's clever. Uh, so, M Mr. Peace, thank you for taking the time to come and, and speak to us. Uh, um, and is there anything you would like us to do with the information that, that you've shared as the OPOC? Well, I, I think that a deeper look at what's going on with this uh, police department in concerns to what they're doing to activists and other people that are raising their voice talking about police reform. Um, I know that uh, you have an uh, agenda item tonight that's dealing with one of those uh, issues. Um, I, I have a, a really hard time with um, trying to raise my voice knowing that in, if I do, uh, there might be repercussions. Um, not only you know, me getting arrested or whatnot, like in my jaywalking incident, but in other aspects of me possibly losing community hats that I hold. Um, and I see this pattern continue, and so I don't know necessarily what you all are empowered to do, but I would definitely encourage a deeper look in uh, this pattern uh, because it is quite tr tr troubling. And, you know, uh, uh, the main thing is all of us, um, both activists and police, want... Um, uh, uh, us to have a safer community. And I think that reform efforts um, are not uh, uh, necessarily, should be considered scary. Um, I understand that change is scary, but to try to resort to these kind of tactics to resist this change um, is very troubling. Thank you, Mr. Peace. Uh, did, did, before you head out, did uh, any other commissioner have any questions for her? Uh, not at this time, no. So we have one question here. Um, Mr. Peace, uh, Lili Navarrete, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, as a community activist myself, also in Spokane, I was made aware of that video and watched it and d do not agree with it at all and also voice my opinion about it. So um, you have my full support um, and hopefully as a commission we can do something about um, protecting our activists, our voices out there. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Peace. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else scheduled for public? Okay. All right. We would like to move uh, next to our, our guest speaker, uh, Police Guild President, Detective Duncan. How are you doing? Very well. All right. Thank you for having me tonight. It's nice that we are here in person. Um, you can call me Dave. You okay. Have to call me Detective <laughs> Duncan. Uh, and yeah, I am. I am here as the as the president of the Spokane Police Guild. Um, a little bit about myself. I've worked here uh, for the city of Spokane for eight and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I worked at an Idaho law enforcement agency for about eight years. And uh, I'm currently a detective, and I work in the domestic violence unit. 
Um, pretty much the whole time I've been with SPD, I've been a part of the guild of the last four years as one of the vice presidents, and then last month I took over as, as the president. Um, and so tonight I just wanted to begin, uh, I guess, a dialogue, um, let you meet the guild face to face. I know that there are uh, there have been frictions between us and walls put in place, and I'm now realizing that there really was no reason for uh, this friction and these walls. I think we have a lot of uh, the same goals. Um, you know, Mr. Peace just very accurately uh, stated that, um, you know, the police and you all have the same goal uh, that our uh, community is a safer and better place. Um, I, uh, like you, don't want harm brought to our citizens. Um, if we can change policies and practices that reduce harm, that's number one, fantastic for our citizens, but it's great for our officers as well. Um, so hopefully we can have a, a dialogue and um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to answer uh, any questions that anybody have. Um, I can talk about our contract in the past because I know that that is a source of friction because uh, I, I watch your meetings and I know that it is frustrating for you that our, that our contract and that whole negotiation process puts you in a box and it puts up barriers. Um, and I know that's frustrating for you and I, I totally recognize that. Um, you know, when the citizens of Spokane decided that we were gonna have uh, police oversight um, because uh, a new process was being inserted into basically our workplace because we're public employees. We have the rights to bargain uh, the effects of any changes to our working conditions. By inserting that, we you know, had a right to bargain the effects of that. And so we uh, negotiated that in the contract, we negotiated that with the city. And the first time we got that in the contract, we thought that we had met the charter and that things were, were solved. Uh, well, we learned that they were not, um, that that did not meet your expectations, that did not meet the community's expectations. So it went back into the last contract we had, the one that drug out over four and a half years. And you know, the whole time we believe as we're negotiating with the city that the city is expressing uh, your desires, uh, that you're, the city is expressing the citizens' desires for police oversight. And so as we're negotiating the contract, that's what I believe, that's what we believe that we are coming to. So well, I guess it was about uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, that very long, three and a half year long negotiation process came to an end. Uh, us and the city tentatively agreed and it went to council and we very quickly realized after a seven nothing vote that that is not in fact what the city or the council wanted. So. As you can imagine for us, that was very frustrating because we believe that we were meeting the city to get to a point um, that met everyone's expectations and met the charter's expectations. And well, I guess <laughs> it's not what happened. Uh, so we asked to speak and negotiate directly with um, Council President Beggs as he was the president of the council. They voted seven nothing and we're like, let's just go straight to the source and get this solved. And that whole time, again, we believe that we were, you know, negotiating with people that had your desires, you know, at the front. And so when that contract was done and voted unanimously in favor 7 nothing, we thought finally, once and for all, we're solved. We've met the charter, we're good to go. I've now learned uh, that maybe the city has not consulted this commission and their ombudsman uh, like we believe that they had been. Uh, so it, it's frustrating for us to know that this topic is not solved, but now I see why it is so incredibly frustrating for you after 10 years and you still don't feel like you have um, the independent oversight that you feel you should have. Um, so I, I recognize the frustration you have and I think now you see the frustration that we, the Guild have because we we believed we were there and, and it, well, it looks like we're not. There's more work to be done. Um, and so like I expressed last meeting, I'm, I'm hopeful now that if this topic comes up again and I will be very frustrated if it does, but I know that it will. Um, I, I hope that the city this time consults with, with 
you, the commission, and, and with Mr. Logan Osomana, and we actually, you know, get this completely done. Um, you know, I don't know exactly the nuts and bolts of the, the independence that Mr. Logue wants, so I, I don't know that I, you know, I can answer if that's something that we would agree to or not, because I just, I don't know. You know, I know what the, the NACL priorities are, um, but I don't know, you know, the exact language there, so it's, it's tough for me to say, but I guess I just want to recognize that I, I see your frustration, and uh, I, I totally get it, and it's valid, and uh, yeah, 10 years is a long time to not have what you think you should have, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Duncan, thank yeah. you for taking the time to, to come here. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, it says a lot for you to come and, and be part of our meeting and, and speak to us because that's really how we're going to make sure that the outcomes that we want are truly going to come to fruition, right? So I want to applaud that. And um, I, I have a few questions, but I'm going to look at our commissioners to see if uh, any commissioners or um, anyone from the OPO has uh, any questions. For Mr. Duncan. Okay. Hi, I have a quick question, a couple questions, but I'll start with number one first. Um, when you explained that we weren't fully there um, or that we weren't communicating, and now mind you, I've been in, you know, a commissioner for less than a year, but who or what was preventing uh, the miscommunication from us? And I know uh, Mr. Log had discussed um, about not being uh, given or um, shown tapes from um, some instances before, who or what was preventing the miscommunication or why were we not uh, being considered um, by the Spokane Guild? Are, are you mean in the contract process? I'm, no, I mean like um, Communication-wise, if I can, um, I think let's go back quite a ways. Okay. Um, and oh, it's so long that my mind's going blank. Yeah. Um, but for a while there, we had some specific asks. Um, for instance, uh, Commissioner Wilburn uh, wanted to look at uses of force with me um, against African-Americans in Spokane to see if we could uh, come up with uh, anything uh, to recommend. I think I and vaguely from remember that. That may have been, yeah, that does sound a little back. familiar, yeah. Um, and, and there was a roadblock put up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think I've been told there was either a letter to, that the guild would, had written a letter of an intent to file a grievance or a grievance was filed, but we're, we're completely cut out of that loop as well. So when there is something that we are trying to get done, there's a roadblock put up there and we don't understand the process right. of, of, of even how to fix it. Yeah, and I don't know on that specific one, um, like that does vaguely. It's just the general idea. Yeah, the, I, I, do, I do vaguely kind of remember that, but that was not involved in that. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but I, I think now we're at the point where, you know, you know that you can call me anytime and I'm going to answer my phone and speak to you that if, if you know, the chief's office puts up a roadblock and they say the guild is the roadblock. Mr. Logue knows that he's going to, he can call me and I will, and I'll, and I'll tell you if we put up a roadblock, a flag or whatever, and why. Um, and I don't think that that happened in the past. I don't think there was that communication between the guild and the ombudsman office, you know, in the past, not like, not like we have now. Um, so hopefully those kinds of, you know, roadblocks, you know, those kinds of issues don't happen, but if they do, you'll get a, well, I mean, you know who I am. Uh, I will come back. If I can give an answer, I will, I will, I will tell you. Um, but oftentimes if we do file a grievance or if we're going to file a grievance on anything, not just with Mr. Logue, um, it's because we perceive a change in our, our working conditions or, you know, our, our 
way discipline is done. Anything that is, you know, we have perk rights to, to, to file a grievance on, we're, we're going to. And really, uh, you know, it's so difficult for us to get a contract. Oftentimes, that's the only way we can force the city to actually come to the table and speak to us and negotiate with us uh, because they're not really willing very often to negotiate with us or even talk to us. As you know, they're not super willing, it doesn't sound like, to, to, speak, to speak with you. You know, I mean, you look at how long HR drug out uh, Louvi May's pay. I mean, that, that's just, and then they use the guild in our contract as a reason. I, I, that's unconscionable. Like, <laughs> I don't care. We don't care how much Mr. Logan, Ms. Lamana get paid, why they used us and our contract as a reason to, to drag that out for a year, a year and a half, two years. That's, that's just not, you know, that's just unacceptable. And maybe one of us should have come here back there during that time frame and said, we don't care, not us, pay her, <laughs> you know? So hopefully this is kind of, you know, I can certainly say, you know, we were, we did not obviously come here in the past and speak with you. Um, and there was never any kind of a desire to. And I know any time that that was kind of brought up, uh, you know, the, the concern was that we would be, you know, walking into a trap or that it would be more harm, you know, do more harm than good. Well, it, maybe that's what's gonna come out of this. I, I doubt it. I, I only see, you know, positive things coming out of this. Uh, we are not going to agree on everything, but at least, will understand why we don't agree. Um, I don't think I answered your question, Commissioner. I'm sorry, but hopefully that helped a little. I... It helped. Okay. <laughs> um, Dave, th thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, having light on you instead of these dark um, Zoom calls, that's not your fault. But um, oftentimes in years past, um, some of your representatives would sit way in the back uh -huh. and just, you know, stoic faces, not very inviting to communicate with because um, you don't know who they are. Right. Um, so just the fact that you're here and willing to, to have this interaction is greatly ap appreciated. And um, you answered one of my questions already is, why are you so willing to be here yet in the last eight or nine years that I've been on this commission, again, in the dark, um, faceless, nameless. And so now to hear that you were possibly, uh, there was a fear that we would somehow attack and, and, um, and, and go down the wrong rabbit hole with you, um, it, it, that, that's helping me right off the bat. Um, I think it's very easy for for us to just watch your meetings and hear what you say uh -huh. and just, you know, just only take the bad. And, and I don't know, you know, I've only been here for eight and a half years and I've only been, you know, like on the Guild Executive Board for the last four. I don't know historically why there wasn't that trust or openness. I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so do, do your uh, rank and file um, feel good about you being here? Or do you, do you expect pushback or do you feel? I, I don't think there'll be any, uh -huh. there might be pushback. I uh -huh. would tell you that 99% of them have no idea that I'm even here tonight. Okay. I would say 99% of them have no idea even who you are. Right. Yeah. Yep. Anytime we have an IA interview, I have to explain who Mr. Logue and Ms. Umana are and that these are not people that you need to be worried about or concerned with. They're not here to do you any harm, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. like. Uh, most of most officers have have really they have no idea what OPOC even the, the, is. The ride-alongs have been on that, that, that I have also yeah. been confronted with, or have it, it's yeah. been very apparent that it's just not that awareness. Yeah, they. And I they've mean, got, they've these got guys more stuff to do. Yeah, they show up to work, they handle their calls, and they go home. They, I mean, right. they really don't. I mean, I, I, I would bet most of them couldn't even name you more than one or two council members. You know. And I, I guess um, <laughs> last meeting. I became more and more aware of the city is, um, I think, manipulating the situation um, and, and creating some angst where there doesn't need to be. But um, I'm gonna hop around on two very, I think one's very quick and then uh, another one just interested in your, um, in your um, what you think. Um, the easy one is how long is your tenure? Oh, uh, three years. Three years, okay. Yeah. 
dependability, reliability. It's like, you know, do you change in a year? So good to know you'll be here for three years. I, I could quit, but no, it's three, <laughs> it's, it's three years. All right. um, just, um, this is a really kind of a random one. Um, May 31st, 2020. Yeah. Okay, so what, what's, your, what's your view? What is your um, thought on, on oversight from the, um, the office of the ombudsman? Yeah, um, I, I, I assumed that this would come up. So yeah, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about that because that's extremely frustrating for you. Mm -hmm. I know that and uh, just kind of how that happened, uh, it, it, it's, it's frustrating for us. So, you know, what the chief wanted to do, what he wanted to have Mr. Lowe do was outside of what, you know, our contract says. So we have a, you know, a change in, you know, our working conditions. We have a, we have a change in potentially uh, discipline. So, you know, we have a right to bargain the effects of that. And so, uh, because the chief uh, asked uh, Mr. Lowe to, to do what he did, uh, we filed a grievance uh, and it's, uh, it, it's essentially like stop, and you've you've got to discuss this with us before this can happen. Uh, so it did just kind of stop, and then that was it, and we didn't hear anything for a very long time. Um, and during that time, I think we were tying up our contract, and I, you know I don't know the city's busy with. I can't tell you why the city does what they do. Uh, and then it was maybe eight months or so after we filed that initial grievance, the city finally came to us and said, hey, we're ready to talk about this. We're like, okay. We thought this topic had completely gone away. Uh, but then they decided that they now wanted to talk about it and discuss it. So we're like, okay. And so at that point, you know, our, basically our negotiation teams come together and we try to, you know, come to common ground on this. We had one meeting um, I don't know that I can specifically talk about what went on in that meeting, but, you know, they had ideas, we had ideas, and there was a little bit of work for us to do and for them to do, um, and then we were supposed to come back uh, within a couple weeks to have a, another follow-up meeting. Uh, they never scheduled another meeting. Um, and then Mr. Our Chief Meidel then sent Mr. Logue another email, um, saying um, this is what the contract says you can do so this is what you can do the guild won't let you do this this or this okay a little frustrating for me because um, we didn't say what mr Logue could or could not do we have a contract that the contract says you know you know it says what we think can be done and we never came to any kind of decision or agreement or conclusion so it was frustrating for us that the chief spoke on our behalf and said the guild. And uh, looking back now, maybe I should have come to that meeting then and said that because all you're left is with the chief's email blaming the guild. Um, so we were completely ready to talk with the city about that topic, try to come to some type of a resolution, um, but they decided that they didn't want to come to a resolution and, and the chief just went back to just kind of you know, this is the contract and this is what you can do. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I follow that one up, <laughs> sir? Do you mind? <coughs> no, please. So in an OPO investigation, and I can't remember if this was pre this new contract or not. It was. Honestly. Yeah, it was before the new contract. Um, or an OPO report. You know, none of what we do can be used against an officer for discipline anyway. So because of that, it's always after the fact. It can't be used um, for any property rights that an officer might have. Mm -hmm. um, why would there, can, what is the point that we're missing here for what would be the change of working conditions? How, how can we work that better? Um, I'll kind of answer a then this came up during the last negotiations when we were meeting with Council President Beggs. Um, so kind of the tricky thing is, is you know, we don't, yes, investigation's done, you've certified the investigation's timely, thorough, complete. Uh, it's gone up the chain of command of the chief. He's doled out any discipline, if any discipline's necessary. Now it's time for you to write your report. Um, you know, the concern that we have is you are a, a city employee, a city entity, this is a government organization. 
if you were to come out um, and say, yes, I recognize that this is the investigation, this is what the chief said, but I think the officer did this, and you criticize the officer. No, you are not disciplining the officer, but that is an official record that is out there that could be used in the future against the officer. Do I think you're going to do that? No, I know you. I know that you are not out to get officers, and you're not, that's not who you are. Uh, and this is where I think maybe it gets frustrating for you is I know you. I know that you are not out to get officers, that 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 that, that isn't who you are. You're not always going to be the ombudsman. So anytime, you know, we the guild or any public employee labor union make an agreement with our employer, we're not just making an, an agreement with who the chief is today. It's who's the chief going to be in 20 years? Or how does this agreement affect officers 100 years from now? Um, so we always have to look at the long term. Uh, so that's, that's where I think it, it, can, it can get frustrating because I, I know that you and Ms. Omana do good work and I know that you, you, know, you do really good work and when you say something is timely, thorough, complete, and you guys do your closing reports, like that mean, really means something. Um, so it's hard for me to, to say no. <laughs> you know, when we do say no, cause, but it's not you personally, it's not the commission personally, it's that we do have labor rights, and so I'm protecting rights, because I don't know who's gonna be on the commission, you know, decades from now, or who's gonna be in your role decades from now, and I know I'm kind of, answering with not answering, but maybe hopefully giving you a window into why, you know, kind of like what our role is as a, as a labor union, because, you know, that's, that's what we are. So then to follow to my follow up. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you will, I could do this all night. I'm Great. sorry, Dave. Yeah. No, um, if we, we have something unique that happened in Spokane, especially in regards to this protest mm -hmm. and, um, I've been told that there, nobody in the department has faced that before ever in their career in Spokane. Um, so my, my, my start off would be, I would expect that it didn't go perfect. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, if it's the first time we're trying anything, yep. especially when it's in real world time, but what happens, happens. Um, and we get to the end of it and then we can kind of sift through and find the things that matter. Almost always, um, when you take a strategic look at something that you don't get to respond to very often, we can find things that will not only benefit the department, um, but the individual officers, as well as our community members, um, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. and, and not being able to, to take an outside look. Um, I, I think it's a missed opportunity. I think some cities around the country that were given the opportunity or had it in place um, benefited more than Spokane did. Uh, so I guess the question to that preamble would be, how could we get there? I don't know that that's something that I can answer, but I, I do know that this topic is still extremely important for you and the commission. I a couple months ago, offered to the chief to meet with him and you together to see if we could get there. Uh, he turned that offer down. Um, I always answer my phone. I am always available to negotiate on any topic, to discuss any topic. There is no, you know, the, the door is not closed uh, from my perspective. So if there's a way that we can get there that meets what you want, well, yeah, I don't know why we can't. I don't. I just don't understand that. Why that whole thing went the way it did. It, it you know. So and I guess I'm not. I'm thinking less historically, right? Because yeah. Because now we're years after the fact. Your right. mind is going to be stale. Everybody will have an idea, but I don't know how accurate it will. Still I think be there's still lessons point. to be learned. I mean, Lieutenant Coles is here, and he actually did a really good write up, and he had a lot of good recommendations in there. Uh, but I, I, yeah, there's. But looking to the future. Yeah. So one that hasn't come up yet, one that hasn't had a grievance filed, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the things that we should advocate for and who should we advocate for them with in order to get there? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, that's an interesting question, and I, I was going to say something, and I forgot what it was. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I feel like um, what you do is changing on a state level. Um, I mean, you should be going to the city administrator, the mayor, and city council. Um, you know, you should go to whoever, whoever it is we negotiate a contract with. I don't know because they don't, they don't send decision makers to our contract negotiations. They send proxies. So I don't know who makes the decisions for the city. Who knows? Um, but, you know, you, we look at like the effects of I-940 and now you're not invited to the scenes of officer-involved shootings. Like, why? That, that makes no sense. Why, why, why are you out of that process? You should not be. And so maybe it's a state level thing. And I think I've heard Council President Beggs mention this as well, is that they might be looking for changes on the state level. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you how to do your job, but you may want to preemptively like get on that now because my concern is they could, uh, my concern for you is that they could make changes legislatively uh, that really kind of get rid of this commission and get rid of you and, and have like a state you know, group that does what you do. Uh, I think that would be very unfortunate, uh, but I, I could see that happening. And I mean, it, I think it is needed. Uh, you, you bring a ton of value um, in the recommendations that you make. You know, your recommendations for changes in policy and training um, like have so much benefit for my members. Uh, but the other hundred some odd agencies, police agencies in the state, they don't get that. You know, they're all operating under their own different policies and procedures and rules. And it's like, well, we're all police officers. My commission is good statewide. Um, you know, I've gotten really good training here at Spokane PD, but has somebody in the middle of, you know, some small agency, Central Washington, gotten the, the level of training, uh, crisis intervention training, all that stuff that I have? No. Do they have an ombudsman? No, you know, so my hope is that, is that, that the state would see you as the model. Um, I mean, I really do like value the work that you do. Um, it, it is extremely important work. It's, it's important work that the commission does. Like I really do see the value in it and I, and uh, I hope you <laughs> believe what I'm saying because I know there has been that wall in the past, but I do see the good that has come from it. You know, especially with these closing reports that you've been doing, the recommendations that you make, like they are great. That is really good work. Um, I'm not able to get um, the chief's office to move on things the way that you can. Um, so you bring a lot of benefit to, to my members and it's, it's, it's really appreciated. It is really good, important work. Well, uh, <clears throat> looking at time here, I yeah. uh, wanna, wanna maybe go to one last question. I'm sorry, question. I, I could talk all night, so maybe I should come back another time, so I, I apologize. Who, who, wants, who wants the last? I, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to ask. When, so, in my previous life, I did a lot of bargaining. Yeah. So it's always interesting to hear how other um, entities bargain. And I've kind of studied um, you know, since I've been on the commission since 2006, kind of studied a little bit about how, has it been that long? No, it was 2015, 16. Oh, geez. I had a few extra years on there. <laughs> it's been so long. Um, how many members, this is just a really, just something I want to know. How many members are usually on the negotiating team for the police guild? Um, it, it just it really depends on how many we want. I mean, typically it's our executive board, which is the president, the two vice presidents, secretary treasurer, and then we might bring in a couple other members. Okay. Yeah. And um, my other question is, so when the police guild, I, I think I know the answer, yeah. but I'm just gonna ask it. When the police guild uh, fire, files a grievance, and I, I know the language, they have so much time to respond, and so they respond. Yeah. And then it just seems to me, and you can verify it or not, that it just, the grievance process goes on and on and on. And I'm gonna bring up something late, later about the city um, with just not ever getting back 
to the task at hand. Um, would you kind of agree with that? I know you mentioned earlier uh, about the grievance that was filed, and then it went, didn't really go anywhere. Yeah. And, that, and that's what we see as commissioners. Um, and I appreciate your honesty about how you're being told, well, or, you, or you're being not told, but maybe thinking that this is what the OPL wants, this is what the commissioners want. And meanwhile, we're getting the message, well, this is what the police guild is saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to really encourage picking up the phone, calling Bart, say, hey, this is what I heard. Is this true? And, and Mr. Logue to do the exact same thing. So thank you be, for being open to that, because I think that's the only way we're going to move, really. Uh, we've got the city, and we're not part of the bargaining process. They are. Um, so I really think this is the only way that we can do it. It's just you guys communicating and, oh, I heard a rumor, or, oh, I heard this, or somebody said this. It's just to keep that communication open. So thank you for mentioning that early. I just think that's really, really important. Yes, yeah, I, I do agree. It does feel like things just don't get resolved. Yeah, okay. we, have the, we have the same perspective. Well, and, and can we go to city council and, and get, get, get our ombudsman a decent office, please? That, that's, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great. I, I'm not. Yes, you can. I'm not joking. I'm being serious. Yeah. Like, uh, who did I say this to recently? Like, I think it takes a lot of. I, I'm a police officer. My dad was a police officer, so I have this lens. So I, it's hard for me to step out of my skin, but it takes, I, I imagine, a, a lot of courage to file a complaint against a police officer. Like, that, that's a significant step. That's not something someone just does willy-nilly. You're not complaining about the guy that made your hamburger wrong at McDonald's. Like, mm -hmm. filing a complaint against a police officer is a big deal. Like, it should be an easy process. You should have some privacy, but we have people just standing out in the hallway here, you know, talking to Christina through a window. And I know. I mean, and Christina's <laughs> got no, I mean, that, you know, then I also look at it from a security sense, like, yeah, okay, I don't, yeah. <laughs> New office for the ombudsman. Yeah, whenever you're ready to start that petition, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we, go, we, we'll go along. Yeah, you, we've been working on that for I, yeah. years, yeah. and it's just falling on deaf ears. I, I, so. Yeah, like, the. yes, my eyes are starting to be more opened, and I, I kind of feel like, you know, the, the commission was formed, we got an ombudsman, and like, okay, we did it, you guys just go ahead over here. And you're not listened to and given the, the kind of the respect and value that you deserve. Um, and this is not just lip service. Like, if this is really important work, um, you know, like, I, I have, like, your, not your, it's not your mission statement, but, you know, you're here to facilitate public confidence in the professionalism and accountability of the employees of the Spokane Police Department. 100% uh, what we want. Um, and so if they're not giving you the, you know, the time and the respect and, and you know, it, it, it hurts, it hurts us as well. So I've talked enough. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Duncan. And who's, who's the other person? L Lieutenant Coles from Internal Affairs. Lieutenant Coles. The well, other guy that, that sits in the back quietly. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that um, all and, and the great questions you had. We're going to move over to the OPO monthly report for March 2022. Mr. Logos, you. Thank you, sir. Um, interestingly enough, the first thing that I had in my notes was that we briefed city council on our annual reports in March. And it feels like 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we actually had a busy month of March, uh, but it was a good one. Uh, we did some different things. Again, we, uh, we briefed the city council. Uh, we wrote a, a, an official letter to the Washington State Senate um, in support of a bill uh, they were considering that had to do with um, uses of force on detention stops. And our stance was that if someone knows or they understand that they're being detained, um, our, our stance was that they should know that they're being detained before force could be used. Um, we were asked to do that by um, oh, a couple of different entities, actually. The Washington Coalition on Police Accountability, 
And I also talked with someone from the ACLU on the matter. And if it's something that makes sense, and we actually had a couple of instances in our past where someone didn't know they had headphones on and they didn't hear a command. Um, and that makes it using force against somebody problematic in, in that regard. If they don't know that they're doing something wrong, they should have that opportunity. Sometimes it's, it's anyway. So we thought it was an important enough issue that we, we wrote that letter to the state Senate. And that was the first time we've done that. I had a meeting with uh, a guy um, who's retired from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office. And in the final um, years of his career, he, he had a chance to work with some of the consent decree monitors that they were having down there. And he told me a story. I'd, I'd heard it before, but we talked for seven hours on a weekend. And it was the story of Anthony Brown. And it, it was someone who was imprisoned and then um, kind of an ego contest would be the best way that I think I could describe it is an FBI agent wanted to use this person as an informant um, and they came to the um, to the jail and provided a phone to Anthony Brown um, in order to facilitate that process which offended the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office because permission wasn't granted and this and that and then it became this thing that went back and forth where the agencies decided to start one-upping each other um, on their defiance of of what was going on there but it ended up with the sheriff going to prison, the undersheriff going to prison, several deputies going to prison because they ended up hiding this inmate, changing the name and hiding him uh, in an obstruction thing. And what we talked about was a little bit of oversight at the beginning could actually maybe stop that thing from steamrolling so far out of control that you can't get out of it anymore. So if we can provide oversight where we do, um, it can save people from deeper harm. And I think that's being part of the internal affairs process, that is some value that we add here. They didn't have that at that time. Um, It was a fascinating, fascinating uh, evening with this guy in regards to the details he was providing in that. We talked with the Guild several times in March. Uh, we're working on a closing report. I think I promised it to you. I feel like two meetings now. Um, we, we hit a bit of a snag right before, uh, probably two weeks ago, and the Guild gets 10 days to review it. Um, the more we write, the more details we, we want to put in there. And we had a chance to meet with the U.S. <clears throat> attorney, and he brought up an idea uh, that we wanted to pursue. So we, we have not completed that, but we think we'll have it to the Guild either this week or very early next week. So it will definitely, mark my words and mark your calendars, we'll have it for our next meeting. Um, and it's, it's a longer one, so it's going to be 25-plus pages. Uh, so we want to get it to you and time for you to review as well um, for our next meeting. We did have uh, Megan Steinolfson, Steinolfson reach out to us for comment regarding um, our thoughts on mandatory closing reports for mediations. We've talked about that in front of you before. Um, so the city did reach out for us in regards to that. So perhaps it is a sign of better things um, that has never not one time occurred before. Um, so I think that's, that's good. Um, we had a chance to sit down with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I also had a conversation with Mike Ormsby in regards to um, that case. I had several conversations with SPD, the chief, as well as art participants in regards to this closing report. So we're trying to do a pretty uh, well-informed uh, closing report on that one. I attended a couple of meetings of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, so that's new and it's off the ground. It has an awful lot of new members, so there's some process things going on uh, that we're trying to figure out. So I volunteered to join every committee I could to at least figure out the process of how it goes along. 
The nice part is I'll be a little bit in the loop on some potential action at the state level regarding training for police officers and uh, the, the decertification process actually will flow through there. Um, so I'll be as transparent as I possibly can be about it so everybody, everybody fears the unknown. So I think the more we can talk about things, the better um, that will be. So more to follow on that. I also spoke with um, Mr. Steve Strachan. Uh, he is the executive director of WASPIC, Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Uh, he's asked me to speak at their upcoming um, conference. Uh, it's going to be in May here in Spokane. So I'll, I have the opportunity to do that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, he wants me to talk about data, though. So um, I had talked with him today, and he said I could tell stories and let uh, Bob Scales be the data guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we've used the, the use of force dashboards here for a couple of years now. I want to say we're four, four years of using that, maybe five. Um, and that was money that was given to us from the city council. And uh, I think we should talk about the value that we get from that. Um, oversight work last month, we had 141 contacts, 13 community meetings. Um, so community meetings are going up. I actually was at one uh, last week with uh, Commissioner Smith in, a, in attendance. We filed two OPO complaints. We had four referrals. Uh, we participated in five IA interviews and we reviewed 16 special cases. For certifications, we certified five cases. We returned one for further investigation. And probably the most important thing uh, for our report is it wasn't in March, but it happened in April. So we did decline to certify a case and that case, Luby May will discuss now. Good evening, commissioners. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you a summary of the complaint so that we all know the, um, what was being complained upon and then kind of go over the process of oversight. Um, I was the one who reviewed this case, so I'm briefing you here tonight. Um, so this complaint was filed with our office in October of 2021. And at that point, a council member, who's our complainant here, um, was, ama was made aware of a body-worn camera video where they were called uncooperative with the police following a murder that occurred near their business in August of 2020. This council member owns a mental health facility and um, they wish to protect the clients and their rights and requested a warrant when um, officers requested um, footage in the vicinity of the business. And then on October 25th, the council member received an email and calls from a reporter the reporter requested comment on an article they were working on about the body-worn camera that was circulating um, following the murder that occurred. Um, particularly, the officer says that the council member was, quote unquote, not enthused to help the police on body-worn camera. And then the next day, an article was published by this reporter about the council members' integrity, character, and anti-police stance. And this was also covered on Fox News on October 27th. Of particular concern to the council member was the timeline in which this information was released. Um, so specifically, the council member said that it was odd that a community member had specific information in making their request to the police chief for this um, information. Um, and additionally, the reporter and Fox News had the information days after it occurred. And the turnaround from submitting the public records request and then receiving the request likely takes more than a few days. And as you know, in previous requests that we've made so that we can discuss um, materials after they've been redacted could take six months to a year. And so that was of, um, sus that was suspicious to the council member. And I do want to say this case was administratively suspended on April 13th. 
Um, so it is complete the investigation portion. Um, and as part of the investigation, one of the things that I requested was a timeline of when um, the request was made and the um, investigator did provide the public records history on that and it does appear that um, a request was made for the records and then it was declined by the department because it was an ongoing investigation but then it appeared that the person who received who was making the request knew when to make the request the day that it was available and so they re-requested the records and it was provided to them at a later time and then that's when they went to the council member with the information so it doesn't appear that the uh, records were released outside of the appropriate channels. It seems that that happened um, appropriately. As far as the process of oversight, you know, we talk about timely, thorough, objective. That is what we focus on in investigations. Um, and so this case was returned three times to internal affairs. Um, I made specific requests to interview um, the people who are, were on the trail of looking at the body camera footage before the public records request was made. And this is challenging because we're talking about what people said, not inappropriate release of actual information. There's no physical evidence that we can follow. And so what we could follow was who looked at it and potentially who they spoke with. And so that's why I requested internal affairs um, interview the officers who were on the, tr uh, the audit trail, but then there were also four Spokane County employees who I believe are prosecutor office employees. Um, and I also requested um, interviews with the administration and city council members and their staff because the person um, who was making the request said that the information they received came from the city administration. And so recognizing that there is no authority to compel people outside of the police department, it would just be a request. People can say yes or no, um, but I did want that request to be made just to be thorough in looking at everything and everyone who could potentially have um, talked about this case outside of their work parameters. Um, also, BART worked with Lieutenant Coles in shaping the interview request to council members and the administration, or at least BART offered to, because that is very unusual to do. Usually we just work within the scope of internal affairs and police officers. Um, and I think at that point, um, Lieutenant Coles was in a hard place because <coughs> he's tasked with interacting with us, but also he has to interact with the police administration. And so um, part of what complicated the case was Director McConnell, who's his supervisor, was on the audit trail of people who viewed the body camera footage but then she also said to stop conducting additional investigation on the case. So knowing that we are kind of at a, um, or that Lieutenant Coles was kind of in a difficult position, we then appealed to um, the chief with our concerns regarding this interference that we perceived um, from Director McConnell. And whether she had ill intent or not, her stopping the investigation um, is problematic to getting to a thorough investigation from my perspective. Um, and then talking with the chief, we had discussions on what an officer can do with information that they learn while they're at work. So if you were at the scene of this, uh, you were <coughs> reporting to the scene of this um, murder, can you go home then and talk about what you saw at work with your spouse, a family member? And the chief brought up First Amendment concerns and asking officers about this um, 
could potentially be a violation of their First Amendment rights. And so then we had countered with um, Canon 9 of the police manual. Um, and this was in an email that we um, had forwarded to you all, so I think you're familiar. But um, for those who are not, um, Canon 9 generally refers to disclosure of information at work that you learn and whether that whether that information is confidential. Um, so I went away from this meeting thinking that the chief had not changed his position in terms of whether they would continue with the investigation. And so what we agreed to do um, was he asked us to speak with the council member to let them know where the investigation was. Um, and so after talking with the council member, um, Bart informed the chief in advance of our decision to ultimately not certify the case as objective um, because of the interference um, that we had described. Um, and at the time, our position was we don't need to make a big deal of this case not being certified because further investigation would be problematic. Um, and part of that is there's no physical evidence um, to look at. And so I will hand it over to Bart, who will kind of talk more about um, the positives and negatives of what to do now that we're here with a decline to certify. So we've been busy. Um, and these were steps that were taken uh, probably over the course of three to four weeks. Um, so if you read the police contract, so what happens is if we get to a place where uh, the lieutenant and I, for whatever reason, cannot agree on, on a case, the next step is that I can appeal it to the police chief. Um, we've done this once before. Um, so I, I appealed it to the police chief. Um, we weren't frustrated with each other. We're, we're just kind of, this is, the facts have led us to where we are today, and we're gonna appeal it and try to get the best investigation possible that we can um, for the complainant. Uh, the chief did not um, go with us in regards to the further investigative steps that we would have asked them to do. So the chief has something that I don't have, um, and this is why we wanted to talk with you today before officially bringing it to you next month. Because um, after the chief, if the chief declines and we want to have further investigation, the next step would be that we would appeal to you in writing, and then the chief would have a chance to also weigh in on it in writing, which is the new standard. So it's a little different than it was before, so this would be in writing and say what we would like and um, to be done. And then the OPOC would uh, make a decision on that further investigation. Internal affairs would get the first crack at it. Um, and then once that was either, I, I think they have the ability to decline it now as well. And we, then we can go directly to an independent investigation, which can be conducted by us or it can be conducted by an outside entity that we, that we hire. So there's some benefits to this. Um, benefits being uh, a lot of people in Spokane think that an independent, an independent investigation as part of our office would be something that has been part of the expectation from the very beginning. Uh, it's, I think it's clearly written in the city charter. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why we exist. Um, and so do many other people. Uh, we have this bridge between the charter and, and our reality, which is the police guild contract, which the city and city council have agreed meet the requirements of that independent investigation process. So we do independently interject ourselves, and at this point we interjected ourselves. We returned it three times. Um, I can't tell you how many phone calls there were made in regards to this uh, outside of that. So those are all independent interjections and in trying to 
get an investigation that timely through an, an objective. So I don't care what the answer, what, what the facts say. I just need the facts in there. Um, and if I, there are people that are logical people that we would talk to, I think we should talk to them. Um, unless there's a real reason why it's not necessary. And from time to time, we actually don't um, interview some officers involved in things because the body camera shows and tells everything, all the questions, it, they answer all the questions that we'd be looking for. So in asking the chief to do it, uh, kind of influence that investigation, the chief still has authority to compel information from his people under Garrity. So the chief can order anyone underneath the rank of chief to go into internal affairs and answer. They can't even be silent. He can order them to answer. And they have some protect protections under Garrity, under Garrity which protect them from being criminally liable and, and things like that because the Constitution does apply to people. And when you're waiving amendments, um, that's what Garrity's all about. So the chief chose not to do that. We can request from the OPOC the chief to do that again. Um, we really think that you should do this. If we get to the independent investigation um, mode after that, if you wanted us to go and look at it, or you wanted an independent person to go and look at it, there's a couple of obstacles that, that I see, and I just wanna be straight up up front about what those obstacles are, because if we recognize them, that's, this is the story that we get to tell city council and the administration, really, in regards to what are the pieces in place in the current contract that would keep us from actually doing a beneficial investigation. So in this case, because there is no physical evidence, there wasn't somebody that took their computer home and, 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 and showed it to somebody, uh, that there was probably, well, there's no probably about it. I would say there was, of either a phone call or a meeting or over dinner, or however, there was a communication between somebody that knew information and the person requesting this information at some point. So we start at the police department, even though this person said it came from the administration, in order to figure out where it, how it got to that administrative person, everything starts at the police department because they own all the material. They were there, they're the ones that talked about it, they would have been the ones at some point to talk to somebody outside of the scope of their duties, who then informed the news, et cetera, et cetera. There've been lots of leak investigations since I've been in this position. Uh, I'm a little bit biased against folks not wanting to do a leak investigation as I feel I've been accused numerous times in regards to this. So I think when, if we're ever gonna get to the end of this leak stuff, we need to just do it and send that message that if you're gonna be out there putting stuff out when you should not be, we're not gonna tolerate it, we're gonna hunt you down. So I think that's important. And it's a problem in all aspects of government everywhere. So it's not just unique to Spokane. But the chief is the only one that can compel that information. So if you turned to me and said, Bart, go ahead and conduct this investigation and we've checked all the boxes and we've gone through all the steps. I can request, but I cannot require any bargaining member to come to my office for an interview. So I can send out, let, let's just make up a number, let's say 10. Let's say there's 10 bargaining members um, that were on that audit trail. I can send 10 emails, and I would. And that's the only bit of it I can control. So they have to say yes and come down and be willing to be interviewed in order for me to get any information. Uh, conversations I've had with different police officials lead me to believe that my expectation of success in getting people to come down to our office in an independent investigation at this point would be probably pretty small. 
I would do the same thing with the administration uh, and their staffs as well as city council and their staffs. Again, request but not require. So they're in this, the same thing. So I can request all kinds of people to come to my office. I have no authority to get that done. I have no authority to go to their offices and ask to speak with them. So that is a, a pretty big limitation in an investigation when the information that we're searching for is going to come from a person. It's not going to come from a computer. So we have that problem. So we might end up with a, with a zero if, if we undertake this investigation. Okay, it would answer that question though, right? Um, we would definitely have this to, to wave as a flag for no, that really isn't an independent investigation because you've given no authority to get this done. The second problem that I, that I foresee as a potential obstacle is the closing report. So we are allowed to write a closing report on any independent investigation that we undertake. I am not allowed to put my opinion in there. What we've been able to do so far with closing reports and is use what exists in different people's comments throughout the investigative process, whether it's in an internal affairs investigation or say a use of force review board process. Uh, there's been a lot of people kind of weighing in on, on a case before it ever gets to us. And that's the nice part about getting to go last, you know, because everything's done and everybody's had a chance to talk about things. So all of that stuff is fair game. So we're able to write our closing reports based on a lot of information uh, that exists already as part of it. In this case, we don't have that. We don't have all these different pockets of information as part of that investigation to talk to unless people actually come and talk with us. So if we can't get people to come and talk with us and we're not allowed to put our opinions in there, we're going to be very limited in what a closing report will be able to say as well. So it just depends how you look at those two aspects. We could do an investigation that might not turn out the way that we would hope it would, but give us power later for, hey, city council, these are things that need to get adjusted. <clears throat> or we can acknowledge gaps that we foresee in the investigative process and stop at decline to certify and still have that power with these are the problems that still exist in that independent investigative process. So we did speak with um, the offended member uh, from council and I don't, I won't say where they landed on, on that process because I want that, I don't want anything to dissuade you. Um, but they were thankful that we were being determined to go after a thorough investigation as best as we could. So that's kind of where it landed today. I don't think the next step is as easy as it might appear right, right at face value. So I'd ask you to consider all those things. Um, and I'll take your direction, however it will come out. Uh, thank you, Mr. Logue and um, Luvi May. Do, do we have any quick thoughts, comments, questions? Are we expected to make a decision tonight? Oh, okay. Because I would think that we would need to, well, I was thinking the closing report or get some more information. Um, so yeah, I can't, I can't comment on anything. No, no it's, it's a lot to absorb right now. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of, channels to look at and, and what's effective or what is not and the person who's aggrieved what does that person expect and deserve um, yet these huge handicaps are needless to say frustrating because here's a great example of how this should work and how we're stymied um, and it is what it is uh, and so um, 
there's a lot to think about, and, and I, I would be reluctant to try to jump on a decision right this second. And, and uh, um, but thank you. It was well laid out by you both, and, and, um, and a lot a lot to consider. That's kind of where my my mind is right now. Thank you. Any any thoughts, comments from you? No. Um, maybe later, though, because I I have some a lot of questions. I, I yeah. do. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have one question, and I've uh, the independent investigation. At some point, and I know other uh, oversight, uh, they have an independent investigator that they have all you know in their office. Who pay, who would pay for it here in Spokane? Mm -hmm. Who would pay for? Say, see, we yeah, the OPO office, right? I, is that something we even have in our budget right now? Because I would imagine the number of hours and, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I, it's hard to imagine it because we don't have a very high budget for something like that. We definitely don't have a line item. Um, and I, I, honestly, I would think that that expectation on an independent investigation would fall on us. Um, and we would do we would use our own man hours uh, in regards to that. And, you know, we're, we're already paid by the city. Uh, an independent investigator, though, would have the same restrictions right, right, um, right. That, that we have. So we, we couldn't say that, well, the OPO is restricted, but these folks wouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Um, they would still have, yeah. have that uh, in place. So what I, I'll plan on doing is, is because everything has to be put in writing uh, right. for a decision uh, to be made, which will be in the next meeting. Um, so at, I will write up kind of what we've said today and I'll lay out the pluses and the minuses of it. Because um, where the contract is silent is what to do if everybody's okay at stopping. There, that, that part's not really in there. It's from the IA lieutenant to the chief to the OPOC. There is no kind of stop. So we do bring it to you and then we'll write up what we have right now. We'll, we'll say the specific things that would make it a thorough investigation. We can't really change the objective part of it. Um, the chief did not want to consider Canon 9 as part of uh, the allegations that they looked at. So we would not be able to add that in. So we can't change the scope of the investigation either. So it has to kind of be what would be missing from that, that piece. And after we did it, we could still decline to certify it at the end because of some of the different steps that were taken at, at the thing. Uh, but it would just be our best attempt to get more information, um, which I think there is some expectation for us to do. So. We will put that in writing and deliver it to you and be ready at the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we're moving along and um, we're going to switch to something maybe a little bit more fun, maybe a little, a little more light. So uh, the OPOC retreat and um, I don't know, Christina, can you brief us on, on that at all? Good evening, commissioners. Um, so we have set our date for May 21st. Um, I believe we're looking at doing a joint training opportunity. Mr. Logue, do you wanna talk about that? Sure will. I left all that information up on my desk. <laughs> so I had an opportunity um, actually to, I think it was lunch. Uh, have lunch with Mr. Our Commissioner Anwar Peace at that time uh, from the Spokane Human Rights Commission. Um, and one thing we talked about was um, it would be great to do something together um, as commissions. And that was mentioned again last month as well when um, Director Haynes came in here. So we had this idea and I asked Chief Meidel if he would 
um, entertain it. Uh, and he said he would entertain it. And he, then I said, well, would you entertain it on a weekend? And he said he would entertain it on a weekend. Um, so we have a chance to, if the commission wants to pursue it, is to have a, um, a joint training opportunity with the Spokane Human Rights Commission, as well as us, at the police academy, where we'll go th through some deadly force training and have a chance to participate in their, I can't remember what it's called. The Vertra? The Vertra uh, machine, which is um, scenario-based uh, training, which lets you know how things are more difficult and complicated than they might appear at first glance. Uh, it's a unique opportunity. Not many people outside of the police department get a chance to do that. Um, it might not change your opinions on anything, but it might open your eyes to something that you would not have considered before. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, see that training play out. It's not designed to embarrass anybody. In fact, I would be surprised if anybody succeeded um, to be fair, because it's supposed to be challenging and, and difficult. Um, but it's something he's willing to bring his officers in to provide that training um, on a weekend in addition to their things. And he said he would prefer to do it in the morning time frame. So if the commission was interested in that, um, I was thinking the morning portion of our retreat day might be a good day or we could set it up on a separate weekend. So the retreat was, the, the original idea was to have a half day retreat, was that right or did I get that wrong? No, that was correct, that's what I, I don't know. Okay, I, okay. So that retreat time would be used at the academy to do the virtual um, with, with the Human Rights Commission, is that what, what we're saying? So my thought would be that it would, Full day, and I guess I've missed that part of the conversation okay. for a retreat. I'm not saying no to it, but I just want to make sure I'm understanding what the original idea was. Yeah, all the um, be right. when we did the doodle polls, it was all nine to one. So my assumption, and I'll just say the torchlight parade is that day. So there's a lot of activity going on on the 21st of May. Um, was that we were just going to have a 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. retreat? However, this training, which Commissioner Smith and I have done. Um, okay, I will not participate. I mean, I love watching it, but I will not be a participant in it. It's it's too it's too realist, realistic. But so I, I love the idea of the training, but at some point, I really do think we need a retreat just for us. So maybe we could look at a later date for taking care of some issues at hand just for the OPOC. Right. Um, this sounds like a great opportunity, though. No, I agree, too. I, I, I was hoping that it would be uh, more uh, of us, especially with the new new commissioners or newer, um, and, and just a chance for us to um, kind of in, in create a vision and, and looking in the future and, and because we're, we're kind of pivoting. There's a, there seems to be some different movement and dynamics, and I'd like to be able to capitalize on those. Um, but I don't want to take away from that awesome spoke, the uh, police academy, anything that goes on out there is well worth the time. And I love the idea of connecting with the Human Rights Commission, that that really excites me. I don't think we can do all that in what I thought was going to be a half day. Um, so. Um, and I was not aware of that limitation yeah. Yeah. Of, of the half day. Right. So we're not, we're, we are not wed to any specific date um, for the training opportunity. In fact, we can go back and we can do a doodle poll with both commissions um, as long, I think that's allowed. I'll have to double check on the public records thing on that, uh, or OPMA stuff, not public records. But our thought was that, uh, there was a training opportunity and then a, a separate and distinct OPO retreat day. We were not trying to eliminate that at all. So I would say stick with your retreat day for uh, May 21st, and we'll find another day for the training because 
we have not dialed in a specific day. So but that was just the two of us. What, what yeah, I want to refer to the, um, the rest of the commission. I'm down for meeting with the um, Human Rights Commission and um, hold off on doing the training on the next day. Okay. Okay, yeah. Because it sounds like it was, uh, I do remember it was half day. Yeah. It was mentioned half day. So. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, so we're saying st uh, stick with 9 and 1 on the 21st is the OPO uh, C meeting. Uh, retreat and then find another day to do Does that work okay but we'll pursue that okay. coming up with a different date you april may june any idea on just i love the doodle poll that we just go in and put days were available okay as long as it's a fairly quick process how many people do we have on the Human Rights Commission? I think there's eight. Eight? Oh, okay. 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 Just so I'm clear. Um, <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. Um, so with the retreat, are you guys okay going 9 to 1 on May 21st? Or do you want to do like a 9 to 2, 9 to 3? Um, Chances are it's going to be held um, at Shadle Library. I've booked a room already. Yay. Um, they've redone it and it's quite lovely. So, um, but just for time wise, I just threw out numbers on the doodle poll. I should have been more specific. So what would you guys prefer? Well, I mean, it sounds like everyone thought it was nine to one. Yeah. So I say, let's just keep it okay. nine to one. And yeah. I heard a yay about Shadow Library. So <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> it's real close to my house. <laughs> that is pretty. It's a nice room. Yeah, they did a good job. Um, and then I can send out a doodle poll for the um, um, Vertra training as well with the Human Rights Commission and then just figure out like a month, month. Do you guys have a preference? Nothing. I'll just send them out and see what you guys have available. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Peace, I'll connect with you. I will connect with you. Sorry. Yeah, I want to see what this is all about. Okay. So, yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. I'm because sure. it's a half-day retreat, commissioners, um, do you still want me to pursue uh, a NACL facilitator? Do you think our timeline's too short? I mean, that would be great. I see we still have a full month. Okay. We can ask okay. uh, if, if you think it's worth it for that amount of time, yeah. for sure. We have the budget. We can do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. We, we did that once before uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and I, I thought it was time well spent, and it, it helps get in um, kind of the, the bigger picture idea to a local, you know, somebody who's, who's got some some fresh eyes can, I think, be, be can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to move over to Commissioner Rose. We have the community stakeholders meeting. Thank, <clears throat> thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, and um, Commissioner Navarati is actually on this uh, community stakeholder. But I want, first I want to give you a little bit of history and then, at, and then tell you why I wanted to talk about it tonight. So back in um, 2020, when um, George Floyd um, was killed, oh, a couple of months after that, uh, President Beggs and Mayor Woodward and Chief Meidel decided to form this uh, committee and uh, we call it the community stakeholders. So we're talking two years ago. And they personally called people. Uh, they strategically figured out who they would want to be on this committee. And they came up with a list of names. It's not a real huge committee. Um, I have the original uh, list from two years ago. And there's about 15 people. 15 to 20 is what I want to say. And the idea was to get together and talk about police reform, police, uh, reform and some other strategic 
uh, things that we could be doing as a community. So I believe they called me in the fall of 2020 and I agreed to do this. Uh, at the time I was vice chair, uh, yeah, I was vice chair of this OPOC. So I agreed to do that. And we actually had, um, I'm looking at my notes because I'm gonna tell you why this is just like so out there. Uh, it took us um, a little bit to get together. I shouldn't say a little bit. It took months to get together. And we had a conversation. It was really good. We set some ground rules. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was going very well. Uh, the two facilitators were great. And they, would, they actually interviewed us individually through a phone call or a Zoom meeting, I should say, before we even started. And one of the first things I said, I don't want this to be a committee where our city is saying, hey, look who we got on this uh, committee and what we're trying to do. I really wanted it to accomplish something. But it's been two years. I've actually attended three meetings in two years. So we would get a doodle poll, fill it out. This last time we were told, save these dates, save these dates, save the dates on my calendar didn't book anything or do anything on those dates um, until the final minute because uh, we did not receive anything uh, to tell us one time that it was canceled. So it's a, needless to say, you can probably hear the frustration in my voice. It's not a high priority for the city for this. And Mr. Peace, I think you've been at a couple. And what would happen is whoever was initially invited couldn't make it then they would send somebody in their place. Well, the problem with that, in my eyes, in my opinion, is people would come in and we'd have to kind of start all over again. And, you know, tell them what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. And it just seemed like a repeat. And then we would get really stagnant on some issues. Um, and I won't say the issues, but there was one issue that literally drove me crazy that we spent two hours talking about when we're supposed to be talking about what we're trying to accomplish. So at this point, I am going to pull myself off this. I don't even know if it's still going on. I haven't, have you heard anything? There was a doodle pull out, but. Yeah, there was a doodle pull for March and April. I took all the dates, blocked them out of my ca uh, calendar and then never received any other Nothing. information about them. And, or if they were previously canceled, it would be like, well, tom tomorrow, is not going to work. So we're canceling tomorrow. Please look for the next doodle poll. And it just, and then I read in the paper that now uh, they're forming the um, homeless uh, whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, well, how's that going to work? Because we can't even get this thing together. So I'm sorry, I'm just complaining here a little bit. But I just wanted maybe your uh, input or to back me up on this. I really think it's a waste of time. It's been two years, three meetings in two years. I agree. So, yeah, I feel that it's uh, the city. It's saying by having those meetings was a check mark of yeah. we let's get all this folks together, um, POC um, community leader, leaders together, and just check the box that we're doing something. But nothing has been done. Yeah, there's no outcome. Well, you know, what a, what a disappointment, and um, I, I know you well enough to know you've been to a lot of meetings, and you know a productive one, and you know one yes, that's not productive. exactly. And um, uh, I'm not totally surprised. Uh, I, I think I did hear you say early on that one of the first meetings, there was sparring and yelling and, and, um, yes. mm -hmm. and just some just um, ground rules that were not really recognized. Right. And, uh, who wants to spend time um, in that environment? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, you got my full support to to um, to back out. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, um, just a verbal. Is there any anything else you would like us to do? Any no, I just kind of want to have some backup. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll be happy to send you, or and I'll send Christina a copy of what I'm going to write to the member, all the members of the committee. Um, about how I think this is going or not going, and I will try to be kind. 
<laughs> but I have nothing to lose, so. Right. I have nothing to lose, so. You know, I've, I've read some of your letters in the past many years, and I, I hope I can get a copy of it. Um, I will, I would love, I would yes. love to, to get um, kind of a, a, a feel for what, what, what you've been through. Right, yeah. thank you, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely have our backing. Thank you. All right, well, we've, uh, we've made it to Commissioner Speakout. Do any commissioners have anything they wanna share or anything that's on your mind that we might have not covered? Um, that iPad cover is like the coolest one. You I like this, I've ever huh? <laughs> just, just for y'all in the crowd. <laughs> you know? That is awesome. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for Can I just say it feels really good to be here in person. It, I mean, you think about it two years. I, when I think, when I thought about, actually I forgot this morning that we were gonna meet in person. So I'm like, you know, thinking, oh, okay, I gotta be at my dining room table and get the computer set up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to be downtown. So it just really, really feels good to be here and see everybody's smiling face. And um, it's been a, you know, it was not easy, but we did it. So congratulations to everybody. And I do have one more thing to say, uh, uh, Commissioner Wilburn, um, is uh, sorely missed tonight. I, I just want to recognize that, that um, I hope he's doing well. I, I don't know the reason he's not here, but he's, he's certainly being thought of, so. Yeah, I echo those thoughts as well. All right, well, so the next Ombudsman Commission meeting will be held on May 17th, 2022. In this room? In this room, I uh, wanna thank, um, Everybody that came here today, a uh, quick shout out to uh, Mark Carlos. Nice job being here, Mr. Duncan, uh, Mr. Peace, and whoever's in that box there. Great work. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank nice you. Job.